All right, guys, in today's video, I'm joined by someone who I've wanted to speak to for quite some time. It's Dolores Cahill, and her science background, her degree is in uh, molecular genetics, and her PhD is in immunology. Dolores, welcome to the show, first of all. How are you? Thank you, Dave. I'm a big fan. Watch um, all your videos. Thanks very much for being on. Well, I, I want to start off, if we can, if you can give a little bit of background um, for yourself and your credentials and what you're about for people who don't know. And then we have a presentation we're going to go through, which is regarding the virus, the stats, the data and everything else. We're going to go through this as, as methodically as we can. And I hope that that's going to be of interest to people who've been following my research and my investigations into it and what you've come back with as well, which I think are, is really fascinating data. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself first, Dolores. Yeah, so my degree is in molecular genetics and my PhD is in immunology, where I was using antibodies and making libraries to try and improve the outcomes in cancer. So targeting using antibodies, drugs to tumors like brain tumors. And then I worked for two years in Munich and then I spent eight years in the Max Planck Institute for molecular genetics in Berlin. And there I led a group and we developed a technology that was patented and I set up a companies in 1997. And basically what our technology could do is look at the specificity of antibodies and profile antibodies in serum. So with in my research group in the Max Planck and in the company Protogen, we made about 20 different diagnostic assays to diagnose autoimmune diseases and later cancer. But the groundbreaking research was that we could look at the specificity of antibodies used in research and used in diagnostic assays. Okay, very and we good. made diagnostic assays. So we were able to look at serum as well as you would, for example, with virus patients and look at whether they were exposed to a virus or not. But what was interesting in my research from 25 years ago is that when we looked at published antibodies, we found that a lot of what was published was not necessarily correct. And we were involved in a lot of groupings and consortia to get researchers worldwide to correct their results and we there was a lot of resistance for that so i was involved in in various consortia including the um human protein atlas in sweden where they systematically looked at every protein and developed well characterized antibodies in order to systematically map every protein and the collection of proteins in humans is the human proteome and why we did that is that there was a lot of errors in the research material and there's a, there were a lot of diagnostic antibodies that were sold that were not specific. So I was also um, back in the 90s in the department of Hans Lerach involved in setting up the resource center of the Human Genome Project. And what we this decided is that research going forward, people should put their published material in a globally accessible repository so that everyone can then get access to whatever you're published. So in my case, it was proteins and libraries. And we also, that funded uh, 40 technicians for 10 years. And, and my research and clones and arrays were distributed worldwide for everybody to compare, to use the arrays themselves, but also to check my results. So for 20 years, I have been trying with lots of people worldwide to have validation results and to check data and specifically antibodies and diagnostic tests and antibodies that are used in pathology labs and diagnostic labs to verify that what the manufacturers and the researchers are saying are actually true. So because my uh, clones and libraries were distributed worldwide, all of my research was validated, but that does not happen very often. So because of my involvement in that, I then got involved a lot in research integrity and um, assisting funding agencies around issues of scientific integrity. And what's interesting in Germany is that any issue with fraud in research is a criminal offense and is reported to the police and that your name would be published and you would lose funding for 10 years. And the Research Institute, obviously, it would be, you know, a major shame on the Institute. So when I came across with my high content protein arrays, initially, uh, people were sending me antibodies. And when I was contacting them to say these results are not what you were published, they had two options. They could have retracted their papers or what would have been very, you know, appropriate would be to publish another paper. 
and say, okay, this is a new technology, high content protein arrays. We, so we could test against 8,000 proteins, whereas most people were only testing against eight or 10 proteins. But there was resistance to that. So I ended up having to report that to Professor Hans Lehrer, who was my boss, the director of the Institute, and then go through the mechanisms for research integrity in the Max Planck and the reporting of it. So that at least if I reported it upwards, I wouldn't be colluding in this in issues. So because my research as well was quite um, disruptive at the time, I then very quickly got awards from the German Minister for Science. And then I was on the German Advisory Science Council. Oh, well, sorry, I, I advised uh, funding agencies, the Bay and BF, and I still do 20 years later on proteomics uh, research in hospitals and in genetic research. And I was on the Advisory Science Council here for the strategy for science, technology and innovation, uh, reporting into the government from 2004 to 2013. Uh, and for example, I was nominated by Ireland to represent Ireland on the Scientific Committee of the Innovative Medicines Initiative in the European Union and since 2016, and I'm vice chair of that committee from 2018. And I sold my company Protogen last year in 2019. So just that I have a lot of experience from doing the research and in academia and in running companies. But I think what's also interesting is that I was involved in developing a vaccine for Africa called meningitis B that was EU funded. And what we showed, we looked at meningitis proteins and we were able to show that just the meningitis proteins on their own were able to elicit an immune response uh, so that you would not need any adjuvants. And that paper was published. And we actually identified that by getting samples from the Gambia for people that naturally recovered from meningitis. They obviously were meningitis B. They were producing a, a protective immune response. And we postulated that the proteins that their antibodies bound that kept them well when other people died would give a hint to proteins on this meningitis bacterium that would could be vaccine candidates. And we published eight proteins and three of them were known to be associated with eliciting a protective immune response and five were new. So also in my research as well, adjuvants for up to about 1990 were just a mineral oil. So they were completely safe and you suspended then the proteins in them and you could eject them, elicit an immune, immune response. So I haven't really done much more work on vaccines, but that meningitis work, I had to work. And then eventually I ran a class three biosafety lab. So a class two, class three biosafety lab, because meningitis is an infectious agent. And I've worked in a class four uh, lab. And I also know the regulations. And we were involved in setting up a lab in my company. And the reason why that's significant is that the regulations are very onerous if you're going to do research in obviously a biosafety lab. So there's not that many people that would have expertise. And if there's issues around whether this virus came out of the uh, class four safety lab in China, I would be very aware of the regulations and the procedures that work. And the last thing just to say is that in that lab 20 years ago, when I ran it, when we went on the course to license it, we were told that we were individually personally liable for up to half a million uh, Deutschmarks at the time. So it was quite a lot. That would be quarter of a million now, but per person that would die in the lab, even if we hadn't done anything wrong. And if you were involved in releasing something that was maybe killing people, you would be personally responsible and you would be prosecuted. So it's just when you go on those courses. So I, I worked in that lab for about three years. And then because the professor who ran it left uh, I was in charge of that lab dealing with the regulators. So, th so there's not that many people that would have that kind of experience. So. Right. Well, the, the, the overwhelming thing that I'm getting from you is that your career has been steeped in, um, in, in data integrity, in transparency, and in, in, in trying to the best of ability to, to, to engage in good, high quality science. And from that perspective, from what we've seen and the data that the, the new reports and new studies that come out of the likes of Santa Clara County on this on this virus and also L.A. County and also so many scientists coming forward. I've covered many of them. We've had the likes of Newt Witkowski, uh, Dr. Sukrit yeah. ba uh, Bakhti, Dr. Wolfgang Wodarg, Johnny Vanitas and, and countless others, uh, uh, Dr. Buttar uh, and more recently a woman who's been heavily censored now. Uh, which is Judy, Judy um, Mikowski. Um, yeah. 
you at what point, Dolores, did something, uh, did a bell go off or something, and then you realized there's something smells bad about this situation. Something's not quite right. That, that this is not how science is done. What what, what tips you off that there's this is something to look into to verify the the data. So I suppose I would have been aware of this in early February. So because I would be networked with a lot of people who were involved in safe vaccines and safe adjuvants, uh, there was and people who had previously worked with SARS and other viruses. Um, and I have been working with a doctor who is advising the White House, particularly on protocols for prevention and treatment such as hydroxychloroquine. So he started, I had met him in America and he was texting me from February about the issues of this virus and also around hydroxychloroquine in, in around mid-February. Right. So now I, I was hope, would have, you know, it's been very frustrating for me to not, we'll say, come out and give this kind of interview previously. But I think what I was saying, would have been saying in my network in February, March and April was entirely opposite to what was going on in the media at that time. So I've decided, you know, there was very little evidence, but in the immunological community. So I suppose there's two things, two major things I want to say to people is that, first of all, there should be a lot of hope that this virus is not as dangerous as it has been uh, shown to be. And also there's um, like major issues like the media are reporting the number of cases when actually someone who has had the virus, like me, I had this virus in January and February, your immune system clears it after 10 days and then you are immune for life. So you're not a case, you are immune for life. Yeah, and I... so that is a very important, because the way it's been done in the media is as if a case is something dangerous. So if you're immune for life, you should be able to function in the world. And then the second thing is, we can see that in Ireland, as in globally, half of the people who die are over 80. And that will say children and anyone under 50, unless they have chronic conditions like cystic fibrosis, they will have no issue. So what I am saying is there is no need for the lockdown and that we could all actually go back to work. I can mention later on how to prepare in the week before we have the lockdown. But I am addressing and calling to the Minister for Health or the Taoiseach, or I am happy to discuss with anyone from the agencies that the lockdown in Ireland is unnecessary. We should open the country within the next week or 10 days. And I would be happy to take responsibility for those decisions and to be held to account. Wow. Well, you know, this reminds me of what, uh, I don't know whether you've seen the article that was produced by Dr. Marcus de Bruin. And he oh, yes, sent I have. One... And I emailed him, actually, yeah. and contacted him to support him. Yeah. Yes, he sent yeah. one where he's basically described what's happening in the nursing homes as tantamount to uh, euthanasia. And before that, he did, I think it was an 18 page document, uh, which I, I thought I read a lot of it uh, in, in a video to get through uh, to, to explain to people. Um, but he also mentioned the, the this lockdown situation that we're in. Um, but it did it did remind me of, of what you're saying, because, again, um, what we've what we've done is we've jumped on these data models which we've now I mean, you can't live your life on data models and probabilities that some app has developed now recently on github uh some of the code that that the imperial college london was using to produce these has now been analyzed and dissected by people and they're looking through and you can see the comments going it's just i can't believe how bad this is and how ultimately biased it was to produce a particular outcome and then bring about the yeah. now the, the, the laughable thing it's it really is locked down for for thee and not for me is what the the the, the uh, situation yeah, yeah. that happened with neil ferguson so maybe, which we now know. if you want to go to the first or second slide there just i don't know if you can put it up there this was from the director of the cdc so in we're April. looking at uh, so it's professor newt witkowski is uh, people may 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 know that journeyman uh, pictures journeyman films they've they have produced a documentary series with the likes of David L. Katz, Dr. Johnny Wadidas, Newt Bukowski and others uh, discussing this, going through the data and and proving exactly as Dolores has described that this lockdown uh, was not necessary. Um, so tell us about what you want to talk about on the first slide, Dolores. Yes, I just wanted to say that this obviously the slide comes from the presentation of this Dr. Knut Wuskowski, and I think it's update five. I have the YouTube link there, but on the next slide, 
he is presenting results. So he is a world-class epidemiologist. So he is presenting the results that was presented by the director of the CDC at one of the presidential meetings in April the 17th of 2020. So if you wanted to just take a look at that slide, this is the CDC saying that um, the well, various I'll, what, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and read it and you can you can give us some more detail. So it says results presented by the director of the CDC pre uh, presented results USA presidential briefing on April 17th, 2020 CDC ILI net influenza reporting system. And it's a percentage of visits for influenza like illnesses reported by the US outpatient influenza il illnesses uh, surveillance network weekly national summary 2019 2020 and selected previous results and we can see there on the graph influenza b a and COVID 19 um so tell us um what is significant about uh this graph so i suppose what people should be aware of is that there are first of all in all of our bodies there are hundreds of thousands of different viruses in our bodies and it's important that the, uh, in, for our natural microbiome that we actually come in contact with bacteria and viruses. And so this just shows that every year, we'll say in the Northern Hemisphere in the winter time, there is a flu season, and the CDC are just showing that this year, uh, from, uh, we'll say, week 48 in December of 2019 to the beginning of uh, April, or the middle of April, the 12th of April, there were three circulating viruses globally, and the first one was influenza B, the second one was influenza A, and the third one was this COVID-19 virus. And that generally, you know, viruses circulate the globe within about three or four weeks. And so we've already had three viruses circulating, and COVID-19, uh, this is data from America, was circulating, had had its peak on the 22nd of March, and that means that people were probably at peak infection 10 days before, so the 12th of March. And then the population in America cleared the virus, most of them, uh, you know, within 10 days, and then the virus is gone. And so these results were presented on the 17th of April and from the 12th of April. So there is absolutely no need for lockdown. Now, what I'm happy to say is that people in immunology knew that there was actually no need for the original lockdown because it was well known from China that the 50% of the people were over 80 in China and in Italy and around the world. And there were countries that didn't lock down like Taiwan and South Korea. This was already in February and March. So we have never in the hundreds of years of infectious diseases quarantined healthy people. Yeah. So because they knew uh, that this affected, so some actually influenza viruses can affect young people, right? It's, but it happens that this one affected elderly people. But what's really shocking and what I want to publicize is it's well known in immunology, you can take preventative measures to boost your own immune system so that even if you were a little bit malnourished or run down, that if you take vitamin D, vitamin C and zinc, your immune system will be boosted. And also if you eat new, uh, good nutrition, so that if you come across the virus, you're, you're, you will get it, you will have hardly any symptoms, you will clear the virus and you will actually contribute to the immune people. So if you were to say to quarantine people for just in their homes, uh, elderly people for a few weeks, then the other 90% uh, of the population would come across the virus. About 80 or 90% of people, if they protect their immune systems, will not have any symptoms. They won't even know they have it. And then the virus will not circulate anymore. So that when the elderly, which could have been the end of April, come out of the quarantine, the virus is actually stopped in its tracks, right? So you can see that when influenza B had cleared the globe from that graph, it's not there anymore. And the reason is that people, the immune system clears this virus, it's gone. And people develop immunity. And it turns out as well, which is very significant, is the first, um, so this is the severe acute respiratory disease, you know, was SARS COVID-1 was in 2003. And this is now called, the other name is SARS COVID-2. So in 2003, that circulated the globe. And they initially started to have a bit of a scare, but the World Health Organization has said that globally, 
the number of deaths from the first SARS in 2003 globally was 770 deaths. 770 in the world. But what that means, and there has been two more circulating since 2003, and when I looked into it, between 7% and 15% of the global population already had antibodies to these viruses. So, so that means what Ireland, RTE, and people are calling the number of cases, that even before this COVID-19 came, if you tested people for antibodies, you know, between 7 and 15% of the Irish population would have had antibodies. So in our case, you would have 400,000 people. So what they're reporting is the number of cases of like 400,000 trying to scare people. They're actually people who developed immunity to the last SARS virus, and they would have immunity now. And also for, we'll say, the other 90%, a lot of people might have low level of antibodies, and it's also understood that some blood groups mightn't actually have antibodies in their serum, but actually they don't, the virus doesn't get into their cells, so they haven't developed immune response, but when they see COVID again, they are some of the people that have no symptoms because they don't have the receptor for the virus. But well, Dolores, so this, that, is, uh, this yeah. is the unbelievably, it's making me kind of angry here because I've, I've known this and you've, but you've unpacked it in this scientific way that goes beyond far more than my layman understanding. I've been covering things from the political and the, the agenda side of things from the, the people who stand to gain from this financially. But it's just so frustrating because it's so unbelievably anti-scientific, anti-nature, I would say. We're being told effectively we've been living in a way that is effectively switching off nature's natural cure as as doc, dr marcus de bruin was talking about it which is exactly. in the absence of a vaccine or of some sort of treatment and we do have treatments now but in the absence of one nature has this wonderful thing called herd immunity and it's been shut off this is what dr erickson talked about in his briefing which has been deleted it's still gone viral they've tried to shut these things down they're not it's not working it's on bit in other places but dr erickson erickson's briefing with the other doctor whose name i don't remember but they were talking about how we're, we're, your natural flora your the bacteria the things that we are we're always That's transmitting it. we're always transmitting exactly. these things to each other mostly we're asymptomatic yeah. Um, yeah. And this is actually, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing. This is actually exactly. improving this our, our strength. But with this social distancing, because I can't stand next to you and you can't stand next to someone else, uh, we're not transmitting these diseases. And it's this derangement that has come around, the, like a spell has been cast, where we are now aware of something, hyper aware of something that's actually good for us, but herd immunity and this transmission of diseases. But for some reason now there's been this scare, this hysteria where it's a bad thing. And it's just, it's incredible because the people have latched on to, but there's no cure for it. We don't have a vaccine yet. We don't have a cure for the common cold either. And vaccine eff efficacy for, yeah. for, for influenza is not what it's cracked up to be. And yet there you go. So I suppose the thing is, uh, if you look, if everybody looks at these viruses, you see influenza B, it circulates the globe, right? So the idea that governments can come and clamp down on something that's come and gone within, like essentially the peak could be about three weeks. And because we have uh, plane travel now, and because they are highly infectious, but actually what that's doing is actually boosting the immune system. Yeah. So why, you know, if well, that's, you that have- that scares people, Dolores, when they say it's highly infectious, they go, oh my God. And it's like, we, we, for the Santa Clara study, uh, which they found is, well, 400,000 uh, 400, people uh, sorry, it was the L.A. County study now that I recall. Uh, between 220 and 440,000 people have already got antibodies. And what the media, some media studies reported, was not That's on right. the fact that, a lot, as Dr. Erickson says, a lot of cases, very little death. A lot of cases, very little death. And, and what that, that's a, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that lots of people have antibodies. But what they did was, it's hard, It's much more infectious than we realize. Lots more people have it. Oh, my God. Don't focus on the fact that there would have been a small amount of death, which means percentage wise, it's only between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 fatality rate. Don't focus on that. Focus on it's everywhere. Be afraid. And we're constantly getting these reports from RTE. It's more coronavirus yeah. infections. More, another few dozen people have died. And it's, it's fear, fear, no, fear, exactly. fear, fear, fear. So I suppose the thing is that, you know, SARS virus circulated in 2003 and essentially every three or four years since uh, so that people are immune so that everybody practically in the world is immune. And so when they reported in the California study, in that Bakersfield study with Dr. Erickson, it turned out the percentage was around 7%, right? 
So globally, the people have antibodies in general, whether for COVID-19 or not, that would test positive in these things is between 7 and 15 percent. But it just means the other people don't have antibodies that are detectable or they don't need to develop antibodies because they're not attacked by these viruses and they don't have any symptoms. So this entire number of cases and this hysteria is entirely wrong. But also, as they discussed, that you, you actually are infectious for about 10 days, mm. but people will have symptoms. So the way what we should have done is quarantined uh, people who have underlying conditions like cystic fibrosis, also people over, with say, 75, and then told them to build up their immune system in the few weeks by taking vitamin C, D and zinc. And then they could have actually engaged in society and no one would have actually been sick. So that's the thing. There is actually a preventative that no one would have died at all. And also, as we know, and I have a few slides on hydroxychloroquine, that that was shown hydroxychloroquine by uh, doctors worldwide to be the most efficient treatment uh, for the coronavirus. And I was working with this uh, doctor who was advising the White House, who was involved in writing protocols for countries like India. So what they did was they gave a prophylactic. So the half-life of hydroxychloroquine is three weeks. So you could just give one hydroxychloroquine tablet and they cost 10 cent. And it has been used for 60 years for malaria and for 20 years for lupus and arthritis. And it's known to be helpful in HIV AIDS virus. So it also costs 10 cents. It's freely available. It's mass produced. There was oversupply in the world. So you could only give your first line workers or over 80 one hydroxychloroquine tablet. And because it takes three weeks to six weeks, they could have taken two tablets and they would have no symptoms and there would be no deaths. So how it works in a biosafety lab is if you have something that's highly dangerous, it's called class four, like HIV. But if you develop a treatment, it then goes down to be class three or class two or class one, right? So what they're treating, they're treating the media, this COVID-19, as if it's a really severe virus. But the fact that if you boost your immune system, 99% of people will be able to clear the virus with just normal flu symptoms. And if the one in 100 starts to develop a cough, that process takes a few days. What they did in New York, the Dr. Zelenko study, is that when people he publicized to 35,000 people the symptoms and a lot of his community were in elderly and when they started to develop the cough they actually just through the door without meeting them passed through some tablets of hydroxychloroquine and only four out of about uh, 800 of his elderly patients had to go to hospital and there was no deaths so one one of the questions that people ask then uh, is uh, now Dr. Mikovits has, has covered this as has Dr. John Iwanidis. He's described as a perfect storm. People look at Italy, they look at northern Italy. Now the the reasons that I've seen justified were much older population, air pollution issues there from industry, a high amount of uh, degree of smokers there, uh, but also uh, now there there are there could be another factor which people have not been able to fully investigate yet. This is something that Dr. Mikovits has talked about. This is something that I mentioned uh, back in late March, which was um, there were vaccines delivered, and there That's may right. have been some reaction there. Uh, quite a lot of them actually. Back in October, there was an article which I, it, it's in Italian. I translated about one hundred and eighty thousand uh, for I believe for pneumococci and for influenza. I'll have to just double check that. But regardless, um, the other the other justification may have been that so many people were there was so much testing that when the acute patients came in later to the hospitals there simply wasn't enough room and a lot more people died than otherwise would have done uh, what do, do we fully know what happened and transpired in northern italy was it actually covid-19 was it influenza b or a what was it that, that so many of these people do you think were exposed to and why was it so concentrated there in, in that regard. So that's a, that's a very good question. But I think because they had already used hydroxychloroquine in China and in Wuhan. And what they did in China was they quarantined Wuhan as a state and a city, you know, in that region. So people were allowed to move about in Wuhan. But they started to use hydroxychloroquine in Wuhan. It was very effective. So what they should have done for the rest of the world where you have an elderly population and where there is pollution uh, is boosted their immune system. In, you know, the media should have been telling them to take uh, vitamin, you know, quarantine them, take vitamins at home, 
take vitamin D, C and zinc, and then they wouldn't have needed to go to hospital and then do the same as they did in New York and provide them with hydroxychloroquine. Now, if there's an issue about a QT interval for their heart rate, the preventative dose for hydroxychloroquine is just one tablet and it costs about 10 cent so that it would be worth it. They did a study on 68,000 people um, and there was only four hospitalizations, you know, related to it and no issue around the heart in a preventative dose. So what we what it was well known because hydroxychloroquine was also used in the first SARS virus to be affected in 2003. So if our health agencies and our governments and the media were working for society, they would be telling them, OK, there's a virus coming. If you, you know, have any issues, boost up on vitamin D, C and zinc. Uh, and also then to have hydroxychloroquine on standby. But the issue then in Wuhan additionally was that there's been papers published by the U.S. Army that where they have certain uh, flu vaccines in, in 2017 and 2018 given to soldiers, that when they naturally become across a coronavirus, they have a, a cytokine storm and are severely sick. So it turns out in the vaccines that were given in Wuhan and in Italy, in the Lombardy region, were these vaccines that have been grown on dog tissue and dog tissues are known to have coronaviruses. So I think what's important for people to say is that we've had this SARS outbreak, you know, in 2003 and there is no vaccine for the coronavirus, which is similar to this one in 17 years. And the reason for that is that they did the studies in ferrets, which are the model animals for these corona type viruses, and they were fine with the vaccine. But when they naturally came across the coronavirus, they were severely affected and many of them died. And so it looks to be the same. The U.S. Army has reported it's called viral interference. And the U.S. Army has reported papers that this when they have put in um, test vaccines to soldiers that the same cytokine storm and severe reaction has happened. You've mentioned just just a moment ago, and this is true of the mainstream media everywhere and our politicians, whether it's uh, or, or in the case of the United States, Fauci and other people, never once has anyone come out and given people preventative measures, told them to take accountability for their own, you know, to empower people with their own health, take vitamin C, uh, there's we're having this fantastic summer, right? People want to go yes, out, yes, uh, get outside. vitamin D, yeah. ex ex uh, exercise, look after yourself, eat well. We're not being told these things. If that isn't yeah. a red flag for people, I don't know what is. It's stay indoors, wait for vaccine. We've got this. Um, the fact that but hydroxy I think it's really important that there isn't a vaccine, right, in 17 years for the coronavirus. And obviously they were starting to hype it in 2003 as if this was going to be another, you know, major issue, which it wasn't. And they've been looking for these kind of vaccines. And there isn't one on the vaccine schedule in America. They have 100, 100 vaccines. There isn't one vaccine to this type of virus. So what, so that what has, uh, what, what are, we had this, uh, Dolores, the, the EU had a conference and world leaders last week were pledging billions. Uh, Ireland has given 18 million euros to Gavi, the vaccine alliance, Gates funded, um, as well as uh, other other com countries have donated to 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 C C P I C E P I whatever it's called. Um, what are they working towards? What what's this vaccine about? What are they, what are they actually making? So there's been lots of clinical trials about the benefits of vitamin D, C, and zinc in combination, and also previously and now hydroxychloroquine with the AZT antibiotic is one of the treasured drugs we'll say globally because it's so safe and used widely. So what I would be calling for for the EU and for Ireland is that there is no need for a drug. So hydroxychloroquine is a treatment. It's available. It's readily manufactured because it's used. Pe people who have malaria take it routinely in countries where malaria is prevalent and they don't get malaria. So it's, it's mass produced. It's really cheap. So any drug that is produced has to be compared to hydroxychloroquine for its safety, for its it is really safe and effective. Because it turns out from my doctor colleague in America that even people who have been severely affected and were, you know, in ICU, after one to two tablets of 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, they were recovered and able to walk out. And so the total dose they were given is three tablets over three days or five tablets with the AZT, and they completely recovered. 
And vitamin C, high dose vitamin C is also shown to recover people. And it was given to one of the doctors in ICU and he completely recovered. So I think uh, there is no need for uh, any drugs to be developed. And if they are, they have to be compared to hydroxychloroquine. And there is no need for a vaccine because the thing is, each of these viruses circulate the globe because they are mutated and slightly different mm. so that the chase up time for vaccines can be a year or so. And a lot of them are not tested against randomized placebo controls. So actually, they should not be called safe because they're not safety tested. And a lot of the ingredients that are in vaccines are known themselves to actually be bad for the immune system like aluminium or, or mercury. So there is absolutely no necessity for those kind of toxic ingredients to be in vaccine adjuvants at all. And it's been known for like 60 years that just simple mineral type oil is, is plenty antigenic for the body uh, to elicit an immune response. You do not need to be adding in uh, human DNA, mercury, aluminium or anything like that. So there is really uh, no need for this kind of hype. And I would, in a way, challenge the media and challenge the Irish government that it's almost neglecting the population. You know, that people are dying unnecessarily because it was well known this SARS virus has been around for 17 years. Hydroxychloroquine is known as a treatment for decades, as well as it was used in China and all over the world before it came to Ireland. There is absolutely no need for the lockdown. And if we should be reopening the country within a week and in that week, first of all, young people under, we'll say 50 or people under 50 could, should just be mingling now, ready to go back to work in a week. Well, and I, people when should you say, now, when you say mingling, should... do you mean no social distancing, just back to normal? None of this. Yeah, there's absolutely no need. I would challenge anyone to say there is no need for social distancing. There are only three organisms that are transmitted uh, in that way. And it's uh, TB and smallpox um, and Ebola. So this one is not, this one is transmitted if a droplet is on a door handle, but absolutely. And the other thing is that masks, if people actually have the symptoms, they should wear a mask. But if you're like me, you had it, there is no need to wear a mask. But what a mask does, it's entirely the wrong thing. It actually reduces the oxygen supply yeah. to you. So it actually, everybody has latent viruses within their body. And because you're under oxygen stress, it allows viruses that were latent because you're under stress, it decreases your immune system. So there is no need for wearing masks only if you have symptoms. And if you have symptoms, you should just stay at home for the week and then you will be immune. There is absolutely no basis for social distancing. And I just like to say there's a lot of thing about this second spike, right? So this, the more people that are immune. So if young people under 50 or under 60 who are healthy, go out and just mingle, right? Even if they don't go to school, but they just mix socially and, you know, and meet their friends. There is no case in the world, except for people who are chronically ill with underlying lung diseases, that a young person uh, has died. And also young people do not give it to adults. Adults give it to young people. But how you stop a virus is that you get a percentage of the population to become immune. And then there's like enough people that the virus circulation stops so that within 10 days, if the students go out, you know, tomorrow, literally, whatever day we have, the 12th of May and mingle. And I would challenge the government. I would take responsibility for this decision. Right. Someone they have to take a leadership role and come out. And people under 50 will say for this week, the schools are just social interactions for kids can go back from next week. And people who are over 80 or elderly should be taking their vitamins they could have GPs could stock up on hydroxychloroquine and then over the next three or four weeks, the people that have underlying conditions can mingle. There is Ireland should be saying we're open for business from the 1st of June. We should open our hotels and our restaurants. There is absolutely no requirement for social distancing. And if you boost your immune system, there will be no second spike. And also the number of cases, I think, as I mentioned earlier, Dave, is actually people who are immune for life. OK, so the way RTE is reporting, oh, we had a thousand cases or whatever. They're people who have got the virus. They mightn't even have symptoms. They've cleared it. They are immune for life. They will never be affected by this. The country can go back to work. And I would challenge to be on any radio station. I'm happy to um, you know, be on and be interrogated by the Taoiseach, the minister, all of these people at the same time on any forum. Well, and I think actually the last thing I just say is for RTE to get its TV license, right? They have a responsibility. And in my opinion, I think they're actually putting the lives of Irish people in danger, because if you instill fear and you force isolation, people, there's actually deaths 
and you know abuse and you know people well, well this is what we have we've people laid off we've destroyed our economy so that people will be put into poverty poverty equals more disease okay poverty will equal the, the collapse of a, of a good quality healthcare system which we didn't really have anyway we had an enormous amount of people on trolleys we had an enormous amount we were already at a huge capacity now we've reduced it because we're seeing and i keep hearing this over and over and again Dolores. i know someone who's actually a doctor in radiology in a in a, in a fairly large irish hospital uh, in dublin has said the same thing yeah, we were busy, but like we never had the surge. You know, we were kept being told that all these data models. Now, I'm seeing another article on the Irish Times, and it says COVID-19, over 560 staff at meat processing plants infected. I'm not going to read too much into it, but I want people to understand what's happening. They are going after the meat processing plants. This Absolutely. is happening in, in the United States. Yeah. There's a reason for this. Gates is investing in lab-grown meat Anything that goes into your body, these people want to control. The, the, the food, the medicine, vaccines, the whole thing. The whole reason I started this nuclear power company called TerraPower was not to make money, uh, and I've avoided that. Uh, 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 but although the artificial meat companies I put yes. money into, I'm going to make more from those than I lost in the other ones. But uh, why, why there? It's not happening in Amazon. It's not happening anywhere where people deliver to your home. It's not happening happening in the supermarkets. Not shutting down supermarkets. No, well, no. What I would be saying is that the Irish Times and RTE should be reporting that these people are immune for life. They are immune for life, right? They're not a case. Well, well instead, They're they have an article for- here. New measures for reopening will see Irish workplaces change beyond recognition. And I'm seeing this uh, very disturbing the new norm, the new norm. Handshakes will be banned. Temperature te- handshakes banned. Temperature testing will be carried out. I saw a similar article in Bloomberg. You're going to be plexi screens. Uh, meetings can only be of a certain size. Uh, they had a ridiculous thing in the Bloomberg article I read the other day, which is that you'll use a kind of a, a traffic coordination app like Waze. So if you want to go from your desk down the corridor to the printer or to the toilet or whatever, you're going to have to first know who's moving around where, constant surveillance. This to me is about control, and I don't care how conspiratorial pe- people think that is. You have clearly stated it. Anybody who is not funded by these organizations can clearly look at the data and the veracity of it and look at it and say, look, this entire thing is very easy to debunk. Um, and so, look, and maybe, there's no, there's no money like in cures. Go, yeah, I would like to go a little bit further, is that I think actually the, you know, whether RTE has its license, right, that they have a responsibility to look after the health of, of we pay their salaries and we pay their license. And I'm actually calling. And if anybody wants to contact you and get in touch with me, yeah. that we have an inquiry into whether RTE has acted responsibly and put the health of the nation of people. And they've actually because, you know, you could actually call it if you do have unnecessary debts in the hundreds. It's almost a crime against humanity if there is known to be a prevention and if there's known to be a treatment. I think we, actually we should question whether they are entitled to the license fee and their monopoly. I think we should actually, uh, I would be for removing because an inquiry into how RTE and the newspapers in Ireland and in fact the health agencies and the government have actually presented the data. It's been misleading, incorrect and causing fear and I think they sh- we, we should actually, I, and I would be happy if there's any experts or solicitors or whatever, and I'm very happy to be supporting uh, Tracy O'Mahony. And what I have said to Tracy is that I personally will take a legal case against mandatory vaccinations as the person taking the case, because there is no way I would support mandatory vaccinations. It goes against our human rights. And if anybody, if there are barristers or solicitors out there, I will challenge the government now at every step. I want to take a case. And I would also, if people are forced or there is anything in their employment for forced testing, it is incorrect. It's not uh, supported by the evidence and it is unnecessary. And we have to call it out now because this is a trick that they can play every year, right? They can have a scare. And, you know, Solzhenitsyn says, you know, what happens if we had spoken out you know, on day one, we wouldn't have ended up in the gulags, right? Well, in this the, is the, this is, Paul Joseph Watson said, joked about this. It's like, what, the, in 2020, our immune system, just the human immune system just turned off, just stopped working, right? Suddenly, yeah. as they, as uh, 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 Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Kennedy. was saying, what uh, this is what Gates believes, which is that good health comes in a syringe. 
as opposed to I'll take my chances with Mother Nature. This is clearly now uh, sizing up to not being the new Spanish flu. We're clearly we're very clear mm -hmm. on that at this point. Um, and also, I suppose it's like the joke, you know, that COVID-19 has a cure for cancer and cardiovascular disease, right? Nobody's dying of those diseases anymore. Yes, well, we know this from the from the death certificates, which Scott Jensen in the, in the United States, Dr. Jensen That's came right. forward, and as well as Annie Bukacek have gone through. And I've gone through that guidance from the CDC and how broad it is, which is that you people are dying with a disease as opposed to from it. And then it, it, similar guidance was given in the UK. I would love to see the documentation that the HSE gave out to doctors because I'm sure it's something along the same lines. We, we have more slides. Is there anything that you want to yeah, go through Yeah, well, I further? just, I suppose... If you want to go to the next slide, it's just the World Health Organization says, you know, that the deaths would be around 3.4 percent. Yeah. 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 Now, of course, so they, they, the title was World Health Organization estimates global mortality rate for coronavirus is 3.4 percent. I'll just go on to the next, you know, a lot of the if you do any searches in Google, it's all about new cases confirmed as opposed to these are people who are immune for life and will no longer transmit the disease. So the, the next slide then is just I've calculated the number of deaths in Ireland every year. So that works out in 2017, it was 30,400, the no number of deaths and the number in 2018 was 31,000. So that's about two and a half thousand deaths per month. So I think what we as Irish people need to review is it is, is, is there an increase in the number of deaths overall when we look back at this time? Now, every other country are publishing the deaths per week, so you can track it, but I found it very difficult uh, to track the number of deaths. There has been and an I increase in deaths in the UK, in, in England and Wales, and what they're now seeing is that the, it hasn't gone beyond, the COVID deaths have not gone beyond the spike of January. And so what it appears to be is that people are dying as a result of lockdown. This means that uh, they're they're not getting treatments because elective surgeries have been cancelled. Cancer patients, I mean, think about, they're, they're not getting the treatment that they need. They're being kept at home. Yeah. Any other, and of course, uh, suicides are increasing. There's been a huge increase in, in calls to suicide prevention hotlines. Well, why wouldn't there be? I mean, people are effectively in solitary confinement. Even in prisons, solitary confinement sure. is considered a punishment. Um, and, and this is where we are. Okay, it's not quite the same as a prison, but it isn't far off, particularly if, if it continues to be prolonged. The mental health damage. Um, people are, have uncertain we futures. We put millions of people out of work globally, and now they're, they're obviously going to have heart disease, uncertain futures. This is what's going to do to people. There's no concern about that level. It's just get as many people onto welfare as possible. <laughs> it seems to me. Collapse the economy. I just included, just to finish off that point, in the next slide it just happened to be from the Irish Mirror online. And it has full breakdown of Irish corona deaths uh, had underlying conditions. But the subheadline is the death rate in Ireland is at 6%. Did you see that? Yeah, I see it. But when you actually go down to the article, they're saying, you know, how many extra, how many people died, which was 1,147, right, died. But there is no recognition about what are the monthly death rates. You know, you should be the overall death rate that would happen, we'll say, in a particular month. And then are there additional deaths? Because they could be that these people just died, but they didn't die because of coronavirus. They tested positive, which may be the case. But I think the, the real issue is that people can take these vitamins and zinc and boost their immune system. So there won't be any more deaths for the next so-called phase, you know, of when people mingle. And if the doctors have hydroxychloroquine at the ready, and the next slide is just where hydroxychloroquine has been shown as the most effective coronavirus treatment in a poll of doctors globally, and there was no financial incentive. This was just a survey. So, you know, we do have a treatment, even though we are talking about deaths, why I think there needs to be an inquiry into the media and the politicians that these deaths were preventable if they had informed them how to protect their immune system and if they had used, had the drugs, and those drugs cost 10 cent. So someone who's in one day in hospital costs thousands of euros. So it's, it's not like the drug is going to cost much more money than any kind of high tech medical equipment. So we even though we are talking about debts, we need to publicize this now because hydroxychloroquine will work for all these type of viruses, these coronaviruses, the next time we see them. So we need to stop the politicians and the media 
using this as a fear mongering propaganda tool to try and take away rights from people and to make them more sick and to force vaccinations on us. Yes, absolutely. And and of, of course, what goes along with that is digital certificates of immunity, which is to say you have to be able to prove your immunity from going forward, which is effectively like like the NCT for human beings. You have to prove your road worthiness or your, your, your ability to, as Gates has said, large public gatherings will not be possible until the population are widely vaccinated, which is basically holding people at syringe point. Was there more slides that you wanted to go through to illustrate the point? There was yeah, one well, no, if you just uh, go down, I think it was the 12th slide. Yes. Um, which says, Unemployment kills the longer lockdown lasts, uh, the worse it will get. So I saw some newspaper article now, I didn't read the research, but on average, apparently in the United Kingdom, 30,000 people were diagnosed with cancer. And in the equivalent month, only 5,000 people were diagnosed with cancer, right? So it means for conditions like brain tumors or ovarian cancer or melanoma, there will be a spike in the death rate because of this misdiagnosis. And I am fearful that then they will attribute that to the second spike, right? And to try and fear monger again. So we need to, and also if people are not informed how they protect their immune system now with vitamins and have hydroxychloroquine at the ready, it's almost like they want to have a high increase in death so that they can retrospectively justify the lockdown so that they can retrospectively justify these curtailments in our freedoms. And I'm sure you're aware of Event 201 and that the IMF had pandemic bonds, that an I, uh, the pandemic had to be called uh, by the end of March 2020 for those bonds to pay out. Um, and there were various people who know if you know that a pandemic is going to be called. And of course, now I do have a few slides later on about the funding, you know, of America for the Wuhan lab and the kind of research that they did just to give people that information. But we don't have to go there. But there's like one or two slides if you want. I'm happy to go. What slides are they? So they are the uh, slide uh, 16, for example. 16. 16 and 17. The proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So this is a Nature Medicine article. So I'm sure you know that um, this research related to this virus was done in America in the North Carolina labs. And then there was a moratorium on this type of research. So what this is, it's called a gain of function research. So if we we'll say the pathogenic mechanism from one organism is effective in making it pathogenic to humans, that if you recombinantly, which is very easy to do, you could do it in a few days in a lab, restrict out that region and ligate it into another region of a virus, and then you would introduce the pathogenic function. So that's called gain of function. And this coronavirus, if you just move on to the next slide, 17, just to give you, um, in general, these viruses have 30,000 nucleotides. But in this SARS-CoV-2, there's actually a stretch of 12 nucleotides that are not present in the other viruses. And this would not happen naturally. Right. So, so this, this is what Dr. Judy Mikovit, sorry to interrupt, has said that it would take 800 years to go from bats to humans. Is that, was that yeah. something you agree with? That's it. Absolutely. So I just gave some of the papers. So this is published, you know, in peer reviewed papers. And like this article discussing it is nature medicine, you know. So this is a very prestigious article. Just what they are doing is just reporting that there is an initial 12 nucleotides. And if you just move on to the next slide, you can see that a mutation will say is just that one of the nucleotides randomly changes out of 30,000 in one person or it changes in a region. And that happens, you know, as a mutation naturally. But what is in this virus is these 12 nucleotides and there is no homology to the other similar coronaviruses in this region. And so it's been publicized that this was actually inserted into the original SARS viruses back in 2006. So on slide 20, there are publications. And then there was another publication in 2008. Now I'm just showing you that it's well known that this has happened. And then another one again from different lab. But what's most important here is that in Beijing, uh, from the lab in Wuhan, there was a publication in October 2019 that discusses this particular modification in October 2019. And what is, we now know, first of all, there was no bats for sale ever in the seafood market, right? And also a PhD student from this lab died. 
And it was at her funeral, it seems, uh, in Wuhan, that uh, people started to get the initial symptoms after her funeral. And then it looks like that it was actually circulating. Now, that's sometime between October, November, December in China. So there was already a publication about 40 people who were tested that was published in China on the 2nd of January. So to have people already tested and in a publication by the 2nd of January 2020, it would have mean that, you know, these started probably in November. So this is just to say that there is an issue with this virus. But on a positive note, it looks like we've actually all become immune to it, you know, and it, it wasn't as severe. And of course, but it just means that there is obviously a connection because this was funded 3.7 million in China because the funding was blocked in a lot of countries. Uh, the same researcher that was doing this research in America, in North Carolina, moved to the Wuhan lab, published about this insertion, and then they were able to identify it in patients and it was published in Nature Medicine. And what this symptom does, I just have one slide, is that it makes it easier. It's, it's called a furin, and it makes it easier for yeah. the virus yeah. to get into the body. Yeah, so that's it. That's really all the slides. I think the um, slide is just slide 24. It just gives an overview that without this little extra 12 nucleotides, the spike would engage with the ACE receptor. But when it has this additional furan receptor, it has another way of getting into it. And then in this paper that's mentioned here, it just shows on the left SARS-CoV-2, this furin on the left, that little pink stripe, that it actually, that region has no homology to all of the normal coronaviruses. So it would be expected that something that did not occur uh, naturally. So, I mean, what, what we're looking at here, from what I can see, it has been the greatest con in, in the history of time. And the, most of the population, Dolores, have internalized this. They've gone along with this. They've accepted this. Uh, there's a little bit of paranoia that's creeped in as well, a little bit of germophobia that's that's gone around. And that's going to be a, like a spell, effectively, that's going to be very hard to break. If uh, the Irish government was to truthfully engage with this kind of material, I can't see anything other than the fact that it would take them down. They would, then they have, and the media are responsible. And I, I can predict what's going to happen. In, 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 in before the financial crisis, the media had a hand in, in the creating that panic, that situation, 2006, 2007, leading to 2008, which the housing bubble. And then they turned on the government going, oh, but minister, could you not have known? Regulation, this kind of thing. And they will probably, I, I want to call them out before they do it, because they will do the same thing, Dolores. They will say, but minister, you could have known from the data modeling, Sweden did something different. How could you have, how, why didn't you act sooner? They will do this kind of thing, despite the fact that, that RTE are complicit in this. They've RTE, stay at home. They've had all the hand-washing propaganda, stay two meters apart. They have yeah. do not, done no journalism whatsoever, no actual journalism. And I believe they're just simply bought and, bought and paid for shills at this point. Um, what can people practically do? Because we, we are in a situation where I think we're, we are on the clock here, I think, to, to, to deal with this publicly, because this is, a, this is not a, a medical crisis that I can see. This is a political crisis. This is a crisis for humanity to be free, um, regardless exactly. of what people believe yeah. politically. And I, I think, I don't know what we can do, but basically I'm happy to take whatever case or to challenge the government or if people are there. Like I, I have this, the symptoms and the cough in January, February. So I am immune. There is no reason why I should not be out working. But also viruses circulate, you know, all the time. There are, you know, hundreds of thousands of viruses in each of us so that we cannot allow a system where the governments and the healthcare system and the media pretend that we have to do any of these things about passport or immunity or whatever. We just have to stop it now and call it out. And actually, if you look at the Irish Health Act 1947, it's very unclear. It just says infectious diseases. There is no link between the deaths associated with infectious diseases. So that act has to be looked at. And also the guards are entirely wrong in what they are doing. There is no need for guard at checkpoints. There is absolutely no need if you are with your family, if you're in a car, there is no medical reason. And I am happy to challenge the Garda Commissioner or any of the guards. If you're in a car with your children, it actually boosts your immune system to go to the sea, to hike, and, you know, if you're under like 70 or 65 and you've no underlying conditions, this is all a hoax and we have to call it out. And the reason why it's a hoax, it's not that we're not worried about people dying, that if you boost your immune system with vitamins and zinc, you can clear the virus. 
there is a very effective treatment, hydroxychloroquine, and people under 70 who are healthy will be naturally immune anyway, like a flu. So there is actually no section of the population, if they're not protected and given the treatment and boost their immune system, that actually need to be indoors. And we need to call out the police, we need to call out the journalists, the media, RTE, they are not serving the Irish people. And also the civil servants who are in these agencies and the government, they are being paid full time and they have pensions. There is really no consequences for them. Whereas if you're a taxi driver or you work in a hotel or you work in a restaurant, you are losing your income and you are going to have, you know, be in poverty because of this. And the other on the positive note, though, I'm actually going to talk um, with Fiona on Gran Torino again tomorrow. And we're going to go through more about the economic consequences I think if there's like 1% of Irish people who are awake, that we actually need to just get together and decide we are we are not going to be played because it's almost like the government wants to ruin Ireland and ruin sole traders and ruin small business and destroy. There is no need. Our tourist industry should be open from the beginning of June. So we have to actually call them out and almost get together and decide, OK, in every little town in Ireland, we are going to shop in local stores. We're going to try and help each other and maybe even, you know, liaise with farmers so that if they have food that in local areas and of course the EU regulations, you know, the half a million that make it very difficult. 90% of our potatoes were imported last in 2018 and 90% of our onions. So for a country that really we should be growing our own food, we should use this panic against them and say, we don't want to be importing and depending on a globalized economy. We actually want to eat healthy food. We want to be given the tools by the doctors that keep us healthy, not trying to inject us with things that contain substances like aluminium and mercury that are unnecessary and haven't been safety tested. So I think what they want to do now, like you're saying, what's what they want to do, the media, is make us worried say, oh, there's 30% unemployment, so a million people are on welfare, as if Ireland is in a spiral and there's not down and there's nothing we can do. But actually, if we realize the government is not working for the benefit of the Irish people, and neither is the media, and essentially neither is the civil service and the healthcare system, that we almost need to have an alternative conversation for how we can get small businesses. There's actually no agency in Ireland supporting small businesses that serves the Irish market. And actually in a free market economy, you know, someone entrepreneurial could try and support Irish business. If people were on welfare for over a year already, they could maybe be given an embargo if they create jobs that they don't have to pay tax for two years, right? You know that we really try and take use this as an opportunity to actually make Ireland work for Irish people and not just to, you know, generate a a template for globalist economies well, and that's destroying what we used to say we used to say in the national interest was a phrase that was often used back in the day yeah i'd say to people and i'd say to publicans as well people are when are the pubs going to open you know the center of our, our community the, the the church the pub and everything else and yeah. i'd say well look the ridiculous guidelines that have been given about social distancing in the pub are not practical and a lot of publicans are going hold on i'm only allowed a third of people in they have to queue outside uh, the, the tables have to be separate. I mean, it's like this is not so this is totally anti-human, Dolores. Human beings cannot survive this way where, you know, the, the, the human soul is being destroyed. They've separated us from God. Now they're separating us physically from each other. What I would say is this is a very important message to people watching this video. Please download it re-upload it wherever you have my permission to re-upload it wherever you want i don't mind please get this message out and and if there dolores is there any anywhere people can follow you if you have social media presence because well, you're I mean, going to obviously this. i'm very honored to be chair of the irish freedom party as okay. well you know so but yes. i i am hoping so i have been advising governments for 10 or 20 years and all of my communications are subject to freedom of information uh, and I knew that I would come out at some stage with this. So I am I have not been on social media because I was okay. afraid I would do something that would take me down. Right. But actually, your uh, this conversation today, which I'm very grateful that uh, you have me on is basically I will now try and start um, a, a YouTube channel or a Facebook channel. And I want to talk with, we say, Fiona and regularly now interview people. But can I just say as a last thing, sure. what I'm offering is, we'll say if the Vintners Association or if there's any agency there or any hotels and they want to challenge the government's lockdown, I am available for free as an expert witness 
you know, I think we have to challenge the police. They should not be stopping people. They have no rights. We have to challenge whatever comes out in the court case tomorrow. That, you know, if you were the Vintners Association, the government have to provide some data to bankrupt them, right? To close down the tourist industry, to close down the hotels. It's wrong. And, you know, if they have someone, let us let, you know, any agency go to court or the pubs or whatever and say, this is unnecessary, challenge it. And I would be very willing to be a, a witness to support them for free and or to challenge the government or to go in any debate on News Talk or RTE or local radio. We need to call it out. And I think if people realize, you know, how our government is not working for us and they're wasting our money, instilling fear, um, ensuring that old people like die when they could easily be protected. Um, it's actually shocking. And, you know, where are they going if they get away with this? They will play this because, you know, pan scaremongering about disease has been used over thousands of years as a way for, uh, you know, empires to get control. So this one, uh, it's nutrition, vitamins will prevent people getting symptoms. There's a safe and effective drug, hydroxychloroquine. The QT interval in the elderly can be measured. It would take be very cheap. They can have hydroxychloroquine and we can all go back to work in uh, a week's time. Well, I, I, on that note, I'm going to try and get this video in front of as many as my neighbors. I'm going to I, literally, you. if I have to put it on, in, a, in a little USB stick through the, through the door, <laughs> Bloody watch this video and make sure, because look, you, you are armed with the facts, Dolores. Uh, we are getting biased information. We're getting what is effectively, uh, people have described that we're in a marketing campaign for a very new world, which is a world where mandatory vaccinations every year or on an ongoing basis with digital immunity certs, you'll never be free. They will own your blood, your, your, your bloodstream. They will, they will own you. You'll be nothing but a drone. You'll be a, a product and property of these vaccine consortiums. And we cannot permit that to happen but look thank you so much for being on like right. i say to people please share this far and wide god thank bless you. you dolores thank you so much thank you david